I will start with uh, essentially two to three basic premises on which I am going to speak. I am going to speak about uh, 10 minutes about innovation, exclusion in the innovation systems in plantation sector in India. Uh, we are deliberating on sustainability and development. The basic premise is that if the development needs to be sustainable, we all will agree that it has to be inclusive. And we are told that it is innovation that leads to development. And if you need the innovation to be inclusive, the innovation system that encompasses that development also has to be inclusive. So you need to have an innovation system that is inclusive to promote in, uh, inclusive development. But in general, we are very much worried about inclusive development here. Very often than not, discussions are often taking place at the macro planes. We are concerned about human development index, employment, all wages and all kinds of stuff. But to get the micro process of inclusion, or not to get out of the fallacy of composition error, one has to have a sectoral perspective. This is precisely the background of our section, this particular session. And I am going to talk this about taking the specific case of sectoral innovation system in case of plantation. And why I am taking plantations? You are all aware that historically, plantation sector in this country is known as a major export earner. In 1951, as per the PhD thesis of, of our present Prime Minister, 21.8% of India's export earning came from four major plantation crops. And over the years, because of the growth and diversification of the economy, today their share is less than 1%. So India's external, nothing, nothing will happen to India's external sector, even if tomorrow export from plantation sector is zero, because Mr. Narayan Murthy alone, or Infosys alone, is exporting three times what the plantation sector exports. Then why are you so much concerned about plantation sector? My argument is that in the current juncture where we are highlighting inclusive development, this is actually the key sector, I emphasize, it is a key sector in India's inclusive growth agenda. Why? Because of the following four different reasons. One, this is one of the most labor intensive sector in this country. More than 50% of the uh, labor, uh, it is uh, most labor intensive, and more importantly, more than 52% of the total labor force is women labor. Secondly, it is, plantation is no more a story of estates and large holders. In almost all the plantation crops, over the years, because of various factors, the share of pl uh, large estates have declined substantially. For example, in case of natural rubber, the share of small holders in total production is, total area is 90% uh, and total production is 93%. So it is an important livelihood, source of livelihood for small and marginal farmers in this country. Another point is we are concerned about, one of the major points of concern for the policy makers in this country is the increasing regional imbalances and regional divides. And I argue that if you are concerned about achieving balanced regional development, <coughs> development, we cannot have a strategy by excluding plantation because plantation crops are situated in, in select states and in the most region in the uh, backward regions of Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Northeast, so on and so forth. So this is a key sector in, the, uh, in India's balanced regional development strategy. And another important aspect is from environment. There is something like a two-way strategy between plantations and environment. It's true of agriculture in general. Some of the practices that planters adopt with a view to intensify their yield leads to adverse impact on the environment. And that adverse impact on the environment, in turn, get, get, they get it back in terms of low, uh, reduced uh, yield and productivity. But what though, so on all these grounds, I argued that this is one of the key sectors in, in India's inclusive growth strategy. But nonetheless, the innovation system that got evolved over the years which is primarily considering this as a major export earner. And that is why these commodity boards were kept not under the Ministry of Agriculture, not, but in the Ministry of Commerce. But this sector, we can find different dimensions of exclusion in the innovation system that exists. I will just highlight four different dimensions of exclusion. One is exclusion in organization. In all these crops, major crops, we have got different commodity boards. If you look at the way in which commodity boards are, or, are organized, we find that the, ex, the, the marginal and the small players are totally excluded. For example, in terms of uh, uh, spices, 
spice board has got under it 52 crops to be considered by them. But if you take spice board constitution, you will find out of 26 members, four are from cardamom, one from black pepper. But chili, which is today the largest export trading spice, is no more represented. And you can see what, and that kind of a board, uh, that kind of a commodity board, how it will uh, reflect the interest of the growers, it's quite easy to understand. Second is uh, exclusion in terms of production and promotion. All these commodity boards are having a wide range of promo promotional measures. They get subsidies for everything under the sun. But if you take separate, but if, if you want to take advantage of these subsidies, they have got very rigid system of, of certain protocols to be followed. For example, natural rubber, if you are a grower, if you grow rubber and only rubber, nothing else, you will in that particular uh, plot of land, you will get 20,000 rupees. Suppose I have, I want to plant a few jackfruit trees. Suppose I want to have two coconut trees. No, no, you are not eligible. So they have a very strict protocol. Of course, they have an explanation. They want to say that this is with a view to increase the yield to the highest level and to become the world's largest yield. I mean, India is the largest, highest yield. That's the reputation we want. But we should not forget the fact that a farmer is not concerned about the yield, India's yield level in the global. He is concerned about the total income from his particular small plot of land. That may be maximized and he may be made less vulnerable to the market if he is having a uh, freedom to kind of choose between different crops, you are aware of that. That kind of, that I am trying to say that there is exclusion. In that process, large states, which large holders who can afford to have, afford to uh, allocate the three acres exclusively for rubber, he can avail that. But on the other hand, suppose I have only one acre of land, I want to have, say for example, a few rubber and a few coconut, no, I am not able. But instead, why can't you give a subsidy on the basis of number of trees being planted? I mean, you don't need a caudal uh, all kinds of to say to convince these things. Now, coming to, for example, market, and we have got, I mean, historically, the, all these crops were having a very controlled marketing system. Over the years, it has been kind of less regulated. In case of cardamom, for example, we have a wonderful, uh, it used to have a wonderful, uh, what is called auction system. But the auction system, the as it operates today, has been such that the price difference between the smaller lots and the larger lots is something like, it used to be 150, 160%. So, there are certain inherent systems which prevents smallholders from entering the auction system. And today, this is now it is a wonderful e-auctioning has been introduced. But the point is that once you sell the crop, you will get the price only after 15 to 30 days. So who will be able to sell in the auction system which is more efficient? Those who have the withholding power. A smallholder who has to sell his crop and pay to his uh, to pay, pay his household things or to pay his fees to his child or pay to his labor, he, be, he won't be able to. Uh, able to access the efficient marketing system. On the other hand, large holders who can afford to wait for 30 days, he can. Now coming to the labor market innovations. And in 1951, the Plantation Labor Act was introduced wherein the particular act envisages that the plantation labor has to be given with all kinds of facilities like crash, um, education system, health, everything under the sun. But if you look at, say, for example, how that is being implemented over the years, it is not at all being implemented. So, so much so that the 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 the, uh, the, 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 the labor market institutions have evolved in such a way that increasingly they are depending upon the informal labor market, and that is also to the detriment of themselves. For example, in a, one of my students she just submitted the thesis where she found that three types of uh, three types of workers: one, permanent workers, casual workers, and small growers. The permanent workers who are staying in the plantation lands, plantation given household in the houses, they are actually worse off. And people are, uh, uh, and, and you know, those who are rel relatively better is the, uh, what is called uh, uh, the casual labor. But what actually happens is that since this, this, the people who are within the um, uh, organized, uh, organized uh, working force, they are not better off, you won't be able to get a future generation of continued supply of clean. Secondly, the more important thing is that the education is actually today to be given by the plantation sector. And the government today, the OPID committee recently appointed a committee has recommended that this social cost is adding to the cost of planters and it is adversely affecting their international competitiveness so much so that the government should take 50% of the social cost. But you know that if you are asking the planters to look after the workers in terms of their education, they will never ever give down school education. They will give education such a way that their children are made to continue in the plantation sector, so they, will get, they will get ensured of a continued supply of labor, this thing. So, what I am trying to say, there are a lot of issues in the labor market issues, which final thing is about exclusion, the research and development. If you take research and development, what actually happens is that, you know, 
all the commodity boards are having their own R&D setup. They do basic research, applied research, experiment research, everything under the sun. And we know that we have got a fairly well established university, agriculture university research system. And they any day have got comparative advantage in doing any basic research. But that kind of interactiveness. They never conceive this as a knowledge generation, as an in, uh, interactive process, socially embedded process. And they try to do everything under the sun. And in that process, they compete among each other. And secondly, I mean, I mean I'll tell you a very simple story. Not a story, uh, two minutes. I'll finish. In 1970s, the productivity of cardamom in India was 70%, whereas our competitor, Gautimala, was 300%. 300% to 350%. At that time, the, a dream which cardamom grower cherished, which he thought he will never be able to achieve, was that to reach the productivity level of Gautimala. Of course, we have got the Academy Research Institute. They came with IC, Indian Academy Research Institute, variety 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all kinds of varieties, nothing happened. But in 1991, an ordinary farmer, he developed a variety, and that variety is today giving yield rate of 500 to 600. And of course, he has been awarded to the National Innovation Foundation, all kinds of things. I that person was passed away a couple of years back. What I'm trying to say is that the way in which, and again, if you look at the R&D outlay, which is given to a, uh, one scientist is something like 7 lakhs, including his salary. That means they are not doing anything. I mean, there is not hardly any, in the name of research, there is a research institution is there, but nothing is actually happening. So what I'm trying to say is that the lower scale of R&D, lack of interaction, and lack of understanding of research and innovation as an interactive process. In fact, in the meeting, I asked them, have you ever met among yourself? The scientists have never met each other. Of course, minister told, okay, before December 20th, all must be meeting. So what I'm trying to say is that a research, we have got an innovation system evolved in this particular sector, which was developed with a view to build international competitiveness. And that is continuing, but we are not really aware of the fact that the context has changed and the innovation system is continuing with many different elements of exclusion that needs correction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. I think